The McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. This is the nature of central banks creating targets. The targets aren't for them. The targets are for us. The targets are for us to know that someone is in control and on track. And that allows us to live with a sense of progress and perpetual growth and just leave it alone. The experts are in the house. They've got it under control. I can go about my business. What is my business? Oh, it's to spend, spend, spend. Now here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. My, how things change over time, Dave. You know, I remember growing up, we had, like most people, LP albums all over the place. And we had, of course, our turntable. In fact, my parents had quite a bit of money invested in something that really virtually nobody even owns now. You know, we've been through CDs since then. Now my kids are like, why do you have CDs? Why did you skip over cassette tapes and 8-tracks? Oh, I hadn't even <laughs> thought of that. But, you know, uh, taking it to the financial field, the Dow Jones Industrial Average started in 1896, and it really was the choice stocks that would define a generation or an era. You know, Charles Dow and Ed Jones decided that just looking at the whole stock market was a little too hard. So they put this group of stocks together that they said, you know, these are what really represent the strength of America. But today, I think there's only one of those stocks still in existence. And things do change. It doesn't matter whether we can imagine them changing or not. They do. The right. largest tech giant of the day in the early 20th century was RCA. And RCA is no more, right. obviously. Going back to your issue of turntables. With phonographs and turntables. <laughs> that, that they're yeah. gone. And when you look at the composites that were put together by Charles Dow, lo and behold, there's very few left that were a part of that original mix. I think General Electric is the only one left. That's isn't it? the only one remaining. Well, you know, if you're not in stocks, we've all heard, you know, when you move from the risk of stocks, you move into the security of AAA corporate bonds. You move from stocks to bonds. That's really the way we were taught. Uh, you know, those two markets were supposed to represent the whole thing. Well, and corporate bonds obviously have more risk than, say, government bonds, I guess, depending on the government in question. But there is still, within the world of bonds, a pecking order of good, better, and best. Well, and over the last 25 years, I mean, 25 years ago, there were, what, 98, 100 companies that had AAA ratings that you could choose from. Which means they were likely to be the strongest companies for many years. That's right. So that was your best category. The best category was your AAA category. They were the venerable companies, as you say, 1992, you had 98 of those. And today, only two of them remain. And it's interesting. This is mm. from Thomas Waters, an analyst with S&P. One thing is clear, he says, the trend away from financial conservatism that began in the early 1980s continues to this day. Now, if you think about that quote for a second, Kevin, you have the trend away from financial conservatism. Of course, corporations manage themselves very conservatively when the cost of capital was very high. Which is the cost of borrowing. That's right. Yeah. So when interest rates or the cost of borrowing, the cost of capital, as it were, when it's high, you really have to watch every penny. Because because when you're paying 10, 12, 15, even 20% on your debt, you can get eaten alive very, very quickly. And it's interesting that he notes a shift in financial management and basically the ethos within corporate America as rates have come down since the 1980s and money has gotten easier, credit has gotten cheaper lo and behold, conservatism is out the door. Well, it's almost free to borrow right now. And so why not borrow far more than you would ever be able to repay? Right. So corporate execs have taken the liberty to add more debt to their balance sheet. Since really from their standpoint, if you're looking at things from a cash flow standpoint, you may have more debt, but it's at a cheaper interest rate. Sure. So it has a similar cost to the older days when that was more expensive, again, because of the higher rates, and you simply couldn't have as much on the balance sheet. But in theory, you can improve a company's growth rate 
with a little, or in the case today, a lot of leverage. And so ratings really, those AAA ratings, AA ratings, single A, down to junk status, they tell the story in the clearest way possible. Well, who are some of the big guys that are starting to be downgraded? Because if we're down to two, obviously there must be big names that no longer provide security. Yeah, imagine falling down stairs, because each one of these major stair steps down represents the loss of 20, 30, 40 of these companies. We began the year 2000 with, let's say, 80 of them. Hmm. And then by the time we got through with the tech bust, half were gone. And we're still in the 40s by the time the global financial crisis of 2008 and 2009 rolled around. And now we find ourselves at two. Between 2008 and the present, we've gone from 40 to two. That's a lot of downgrades. And all that are left are Johnson & Johnson and Microsoft. ExxonMobil lost its AAA rating last month, which it had held since the Great Depression. Well, I can sort of see ExxonMobil. I mean, it's got the double hit. Uh, the energy prices, of course, are very, very low. And they probably took that debt out before the oil fell. But the interesting thing about that company is they've been through so many cyclical downturns mm -hmm. that I think they're not unfamiliar with the price of oil going up and down. So there is some interesting things happening across the spectrum, and it's not just energy companies that have come under pressure. You know, as rates have declined, everyone has gotten in on the refinancing and expansion of debt on their balance sheets. So it's not necessarily the oil or the profitability of what's being produced. It's just too much debt. Too much debt. Four trillion dollars in new debt has been added by U.S. corporations in the investment and the junk categories since 2008. And because everything in life is cyclical, even we would remind you that the hubris that's inherent to the central bankers' belief that they can hold rates <laughs> indefinitely mm. at a low level, that hubris too Two runs in a cycle. Well, pride cometh before the fall. So, you know, anytime you start to hear the pride of the central bankers, you realize that it's not going to last long. We will do this as opposed to we will try to do this. There really is no qualification anymore. And mm. the real culling, as I mentioned, the real culling of these companies began in the year 2000. And then again, it just was a wipeout in terms of the top rating 2010, 2008 to the present two remaining. And to me, it's a little bit like a story from National Geographic. If you were to step back in time and say, okay, we were looking at this feature in National Geographic about the financial dinosaurs and the environmental factors that wiped them out. The cycle of financial conservatism from one end to financial creativity on the other end of the spectrum, it really has run its course. Hmm. And I realize we're probably getting ahead of ourselves because, of course, Johnson & Johnson and Microsoft are still very robust companies. You know, they can finance very inexpensively. But keep this in mind. Even those who are now in the junk category can finance inexpensively. Here in the office, we were talking about this morning, Steve Wynn's recent comments, where he says, look, I don't quite understand it, but I've been able to refinance all of my debt. I'm in gambling. I'm in casinos. Hmm. This is not medical products. This is not boxes of cereal. This is not Microsoft selling a software package and putting it on everyone's computer. I'm in casinos and I'm financed at less than 4% on my entire debt structure. He said, well, I like that. This won't end well. And I, you know why he says that? He says it won't end well because 4% for casinos doesn't adequately represent the risk in the equation sure. any more than the entire spectrum of debt that we have out there. And we're not talking about just the $4 trillion, but it's now into the tens of trillions here in the United States just in terms of corporate debt. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the incredible real estate boom that occurred with so much free debt that was given early in the 2000s. You know, when we look at existing home sales now, we're seeing an increase in buying. You know, when you say 4%, people's mortgages now are 3 to 4%. We also know there's no wiggle room in a lot of those people's budgets. Yeah, so a 15-year mortgage is under 3 percent and a 30 year mortgage is just a skosh over maybe three and a half three and three quarters percent and it was interesting to see april existing home sales they increased month over month by almost two percent 1.7 and year over year by six percent and the leader in there kind of what drug the numbers higher was a 12 percent surge in the midwest and once again the details matter since when has a boom 
in condo sales in the Midwest, which that little segment was up 10%, and it raised everything nationally overall. Since when is a boom in condo sales in the Midwest been evidence of a healthy real estate market? Well, isn't that normally the sign of the end of a real estate market? Sure, because when you're talking about sort of a migration of value, when people can no longer afford a single-family home, they end up moving to condos, townhomes, apartments, things of that nature. And basically, it is the sign of the end of the cycle, not the beginning. And, you know, that takes me to something, honestly, Dave, I don't like thinking about or talking about the replacement of people with automation. But, you know, when you see these states that are going for mandatory raises in minimum wage, what we're starting to see is a wave of just replacement. Okay, if we're going to have a minimum wage, granted, it's a living wage, they call it, but a minimum wage that is going to be high enough to actually make the bills, we're unfortunately going to have to lay you off because we've got a computer or we've got a screen, a touch screen that'll do exactly what you do and probably more efficiently. Right. The fight for 15 is what it's been called. It is really in that category of be careful what you wish for. More money. Well, frankly, more money is not always the right answer. It's just the easiest answer. The Fed's come up with that. <laughs> Corporations and borrowing more money have certainly tried to do that in terms of papering over weakness in their business growth. And you see this, too, with the political solution. I grant you there is a case to be made for a living wage. But the easy answer of just give them more money is not necessarily the correct answer. Wendy's this week is announcing that they're replacing not one or two, but all of their cashiers with ordering kiosks at 6,000 locations. That's a huge hit to employment for all those people who would normally be taking orders. Well, let's just say three cashiers per location, and it's probably more than that if you're talking about running the clock, but 12, 14-hour days and serving food during those time frames, but at least eighteen to 20,000 people. And this is in response to the mandated $15 an hour minimum wage in New York City mm. and the $10 hour level in California. And it's just, if you push too far, what is the response, whether it's robotics or AI or computers, it wipes out employment for an entire swath of the population. And quite frankly, this is an at-risk segment of the population anyways. It's not a swath that can easily be retooled, retrained. To a large degree, it wasn't tooled and skilled in the first place. Well, and that brings up a point because sometimes a person would say, well, gosh, if they're being replaced here, maybe they'll be able to take on a higher level job, something that actually would be more than a 15 hour job. And I'm sure that's the case. But are these people educationally, are they ready for it? I think the folks at Investors Business Daily point out the real problem here, because when you force someone out of the labor force in this segment of the population, IBD points out that 50 percent, 50 percent of high school grads do not have the skills needed for technical training programs or for college. So, you know, the idea that they could go to a tech school or go back to school and get a degree, they're not ready for it. These are high school graduates who are not going to be able to because they didn't get the skills they needed in high school. And so the retraining effort, there's really not something that can fix this particular problem. Pushing for higher wages, in all likelihood, builds out the ranks of the permanently unemployed. And so you see kind of an echo of this. Like health care, our public schools don't seem to improve the more money you throw at them. And apparently improving wages doesn't improve the plight of your average Wendy's employee either. Well, you know, staying on the line of debt, because we talked about housing debt, we talked about corporations getting to the point where they're taking out too much debt, they can no longer be rated as AAA bonds because they're no longer secure in their payments. The Federal Accounting Standard Board has new requirements, because let's look at the other side of debt, the people who loan, okay? The people who loan money out, the banks, if you look at the bank rating sheets over the last six, seven, eight years since the global financial crisis, Dave, their ratings have improved quite a bit. And I think that we have to take into account some of the leniency that they've had getting through this crisis. It seems like that's probably going to be tightened up maybe at the wrong time. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, when we were in the Lehman Brother crisis days, we were dealing with organizations that had 
you know, in some instances, 40 to one leverage. That is, you know, company capital of $1 for every $40 in loans. So if you ended up seeing an impairment in those loans, the value of those loans dropped at all relative to your company capital, it was very easy to get wiped out. So the greater the leverage, the greater the risk. Unless you were the chosen few who were too big to fail. Too big to fail or conveniently knew the priest who could perform the forced shotgun wedding. You know, if, it was, <laughs> yeah. you know, if you were Merrill, you were fine because B of A was waiting there for you with open arms. Moynihan, the CEO at B of A, might have a very different retelling of that tale. But you're right. The Federal Accounting Standards Board in 2008-2009 was in the process of changing rules right in the middle of a chaotic period. And they were tightening the rules. And they were tightening the rules. And the problem is you find regulators doing the right thing at the wrong time almost all the time. Mm. When things are going well, you should be tightening up the rules and tightening up the standards. I mean, it's almost like, you know, was Joseph setting aside grain in the lean years for the lean years? He was seven years too early. He was, and he was tightening up and he was extracting a 20% tax from the very profitable and productive fields so that the coffers could be filled for the seven lean years. In other words, he was operating on a counter-cyclical basis. The problem with most bureaucrats is they respond to crisis and feel like they now have the impetus and the permission to do something when they wouldn't have been able to get anything done politically when things were not going against them. The right. problem is when you start putting in new standards, higher standards in the context of crisis, it can exacerbate the problem. And that's what was happening with the bank standards by the FASB in 2008 and 2009. They were requiring that assets be marked to market instead of marked to model or marked to make believe. In other words, Mark to market is you have to actually come up with a real price for the assets on your balance sheet as opposed to figuring out some sort of a model in your mind, which again, you may say, well, I just, I think it's worth $75. Well, how do you know? I've run the numbers and it should be worth 75 or 80, maybe 60. Well, and we talked about this during that time on this commentary, how they were just making up the numbers. Now, something you can't really make up is the reserve, okay? A bank has a certain requirement for reserves. The higher the reserves that they have to hold, the lower their profitability. And this is the FASB rules that are coming into play right now. They're discussing this now, and I think by the time that it becomes reality, I think we're back in the middle of another crisis. So you know, if you're looking at these things sort of in slow motion... The crisis is just around the corner, and FASB is now having the conversation again about mandating higher loan loss reserves. And so currently, they're at about 1.3% of the total loan book value, and they'll in all likelihood be required to come in at about 3%. And again, it's just this is how FASB time things. The requirements are going to be in place by 2020. That's the effective date. Mm. And banks are right now trying to wrap their minds around it, trying to model for it, trying to figure out how they can do this. Increasing reserves, as you just said, has the effect of lowering profitability because it's lowering your leverage ratios. And so they're not wanting to do it too soon, but they also can't wait until December 31st, 2019. It has to be sort of eased in. Well, and even though the banks have been given a lot of leeway and this doesn't go into effect for a few years, we're already seeing big, big banks getting squeezed. You know, Deutsche Bank has been in the news several times this year. I remember, Dave, it hasn't been too long ago that Deutsche Bank, their billboards were bragging on they were the bank of Krispy Kreme donuts. And they were the ones who got behind that whole fat and craze at the time. Now, the crazy thing is this. Where are Krispy Kreme donuts now? I mean, there was one on every corner for a little while. And where is Deutsche Bank going? And where's Deutsche Bank? It's really a systemic issue. It's not just one particular bank. But when you exist in a zero rate or negative interest rate environment, the net interest margin for banks gets squeezed. So you've already got suffering profitability amongst banks on that front. If you're going to lower your leverage ratios by increasing your loan loss reserves, it's almost like a double whammy. I'm going to hit you with the right fist. That's negative interest rates. I'm going to hit you with the left fist. And that is, again, an increase in loan loss reserves, which is prudent. It's prudent. Actually, loan loss reserves, going back to that idea of financial conservatism, it should be 5%. Sure. 
Which means if you put 100 bucks in a bank and they keep five and loan out 95 That still seems pretty conservative, but for the average banker today, it's like, oh, well, what? I got to have those last three bucks. Right. <laughs> five. Right. No, l- l- let's make it two. Let's Reminds make it you two. Of Jimmy Stewart. And, you know, it's <laughs> a wonderful life. You know, it's in, it's in Ethel's house and it's in, you know. But, okay, the banks, however... I don't have too much sympathy for it. Honestly, Dave, I've watched financial crisis after financial crisis, especially the last one, the big one that we went through. And the banks seem to always be given favor. Now, here's what we need to do. We need to actually listen to what Draghi is saying, because Draghi is saying it's really not the debt problem. It's not the banks. It's not borrowing too much money. It's this stupid savings glut. These people are not borrowing and spending. Well, which suggests that he thinks that banks have a totally different role than maybe we on the street think they have. Your relationship with the bank is that you have an account with a bank, probably one or two here locally, and from your income, you save and deposit at that bank. And what he's suggesting is that actually it's not savings held that is the primary function of the bank, but it is credit extended sure. that is the primary function of the bank. And as such, the real problem, this is Draghi's point, and he's just echoing Ben Bernanke, he believes that there is a savings glut. And that the savings glut, not a central bank credit glut, he won't go there, but he's suggesting that it is a savings glut. And again, this is straight out of Bernanke's, it's almost like they're reading from the same hymnal, that that is the cause for global financial crisis. That is the cause for nearly every version of instability over the past decade. It's that darn piggy bank. It's the savings club. If you think about the piggy bank that we always saw as sort of that iconic picture of saving, that's actually the nemesis of the current economy. We need to break those piggy banks and start spending that money. I think that's so much hogwash. But academics prefer this explanation in part because it complements the Keynesian penchant to force more domestic spending. Right. Don't they call that demand management? That's right. When you're looking at aggregate demand, looking at forcing up aggregate demand, too much savings... And there is, according to, you know, sort of the cult followers of that Englishman, Mr. Keynes, there's not enough spending. There's not enough end demand for finished goods. And I think that it's forgotten by Draghi. I think it's forgotten by Ben Bernanke, who's, of course, retired and on the speaker's circuit, that it's the liquidity that central banks have created and have thus far failed to get into the economy to create healthy growth. It's not getting into the economy. And honestly, maybe this is a bit of a stretch, but I can't help but think of Draghi and his global colleagues a bit like befuddled waterboard specialists at Guantanamo. Mm -hmm. I mean, and here's what they're doing. They're failing to recognize the impossibility of a body taking in a forced gargantuan amount of liquidity. And rather, they'd stand back and say, look, I know where the problem is. This prisoner's got a water bottle. And he hasn't used it. Right. I mean, the whole process of excess credit creation, so much credit that normal individuals, normal firms, companies, private businesses, they don't know how to react to it. We all tell you who does. Speculators. Speculators. Absolutely. Speculators like, yeah, yeah, let's see that spending go more. But it's the wrong meme to continually blame excess savings for slowness of economic growth when rational minds can't absorb the utilization of. They can't. Think of the long-term burden of more debt layered on top of an already large stock of existing debt. So a reasonable person would say, look, if I've got $50,000 in debt to pay off, maybe it's a combination of student loans, credit cards, and I'm not even including the mortgage. Do I really want to add to that existing burden? Because we're talking about the burden of interest, interest on existing debts. Do individuals and firms opt to stash some cash in anticipation of repayment of debt? Absolutely. And you see that this week in the headlines, everyone's talking again about corporate cash getting above $1.8, $1.7 trillion. It's a lot of cash. But guess what? Look at the rest of the balance sheet. They have more debt than they know what to do with. And if you're looking at repayments that they have to make, corporations have to make in just a few years, it's going to suck dry every bit of that cash. Well, and you're talking about stashing cash because of too much debt 
but frankly, it's also because of lower interest rates. You've brought that out in the last few months, especially the Asians are saving more and more and more as interest rates drop further and further. Why would you even save it in the bank necessarily? So it's not just not taking out debt. It's also the incredibly low interest rates. And the Keynesian way would say, well, let's just lower them further. I think it's one thing to attribute expertise to Draghi and our central bankers here in the United States. And they do have a certain professionalism and expertise, given their job titles, job descriptions, and job requirements. But this, I think, really important. When these central bankers criticize savings, you need to check the source of the criticism because they're not just professionals. They're central bankers. They are in the business of extending credit and ensuring that banking and financial firms do the same ad infinitum. The reason for existence is pushing credit, pushing, 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 and they don't know what limits are. And that's evidenced by the expansion in central bank balance sheets. Look at the Fed balance sheet. Look at the ECB balance sheet. The ECB balance sheet is now back above $3 trillion. And so far, they haven't generated growth. Right. We've redoubled our efforts. We've seen $90 billion a month in purchases by the ECB. And this is to reliquify the system. Again, a central bank encouraging bankers to do what bankers do best, not encourage savings, but encourage higher and higher and higher and higher levels of debt. And you just think, gosh, where's the glut? I know exactly where the glut is. The glut is in central bank credit, not savings. Well, I'll tell you what then. Let's go ahead and look at this because I'm going to say au contraire on no growth. I think you're wrong on that, Dave. And I work for you, so I have to be careful when I say I think you're wrong on that. (laughs) But actually, the Federal Reserve is saying, oh, we do have growth and we're adding it to the dot plot. We're going to use as part of our analysis as to where to put interest rates, how to manage, by how the stock market's growing. Now, talk about an incredibly artificial way of looking at growth. You said it yourself. The speculators love this. Okay, The speculators are in the stock market. The stock market's been either growing or holding. And now the Federal Reserve's saying, well, we don't need to look at economic statistics. Let's just look at the stock market. Yeah, well, and that is a reality. The dot plot matrix that the Fed uses, the various data points, which all tie together and give them sort of a comprehensive picture of what decisions need to be made on the basis of the evidence, you know, on a weighted basis. And believe it or not, the Fed is relying on to shape their monetary policy more and more. The stock market. You know, last week we discussed the labor market condition index. We've had the last four readings, which have been negative. And this week, the reminder is that a very significant, a growing number in terms of its significance to the Fed schematically is how the stock market fits in to this total picture. Why is it more prominent? Why is that role being given a more prominent position in the Fed's thinking and direction? I think a lot of it has to do with public perception, you know, because it is the litmus that everyone in the economy looks at. I mean, more than wages and home prices and everything else, these are things that move on a turtle's pace. Mm -hmm. But if you can give someone in real time a confirmation that they're okay, I'm okay, you're okay, we're okay, the stock market does that. Or it communicates something very differently. And so loosening policy, if stocks are falling, that's what we've seen over and over again. In theory... In theory, they would tighten as things improve, but that has yet to occur. Right. I had a sweet white wine a couple weeks ago. It was a a Riesling from the Rheingau region, and I think it was made by Dr. Lucen. And and I thought, I wonder if this is what they serve at Fed Soirees. That's it. Yeah, it's a nice, sweet white wine, but it'll make you punch drunk with the wrong information. You know, I want to go, since we're still talking about the Federal Reserve, to a quote that Yellen made just recently. And it seems so far off the mark from what we would actually think is true. You remember the guest Tomas Sedlacek, and he said, there's almost a religion these days amongst the central bankers, and that's the religion of continuous growth. And you know, Yellen, one of the high priestesses of this religion, said the other day, I think it's a myth that expansions die of old age. Is she talking about forever growth? Well, I think that's actually probably one of the purest expressions of humanism, where you have faith in 
themselves. That's what's on full display. Mm. You know, where a central banker says, I think it's a myth that expansions die of old age. Why? Well, not only is The Economist magazine attempting to frame this whole discussion, but here with the chief economist here in the United States, if you will, is arguing the same thing. You know, when somebody says this time it's different, you almost always need to take cover. Remember Francis Fukuyama yeah. when he, when oh, he was sure. saying that we're really done with global war? Well, that's right. In the 1990s, he wrote his book, The End of History. And it was the end of history because for Fukuyama, it was obvious that world peace had emerged and that a new and permanent age of global prosperity was upon us, that globalization had united us economically. And this idea of you know, international relations volatility was a thing of the past. And that's basically where our chief economist, Janet Yellen, and The Economist magazine is going. They would say expansions don't die of old age, which is to say the current business cycle at seven plus years is not long in the tooth. We're just getting started. And what you need to understand fundamentally is that we will just change the composition of growth, but expansion will continue. The cycle is in essence a thing of the past. We don't have any cycles anymore. It is perpetual growth, just like Fukuyama suggested, perpetual peace from this point forward. Mm. Again, we go back to that notion of everything runs in a cycle, including the hubris of central bankers who put themselves at the center of the faith scheme. And in this case, Janet Yellen believes in herself almost like Donald Trump believes in himself, only she's not quite as obnoxious. Well, you were talking about perception or faith management. That's what they're really doing. You know, after the depressions, governments and central banks directly fought pessimism by pumping money into welfare and unemployment programs. Okay. And so they can manipulate interest rates. They can keep growth on track. They can manipulate the stock market. If that's the perception that they can give to the person who's either making a decision to spend money, borrow money, or to save money, they want to manage that perception. But it doesn't last. It's a false high. It's like that glass of white wine. If you had too much of it, you'll feel good for a while. You know, of course, we've got a few analogies these days from our triathlon training, which are events coming up in <laughs> less than 10 days, yeah. we will be floating, we will be spinning, we will be rolling down a hill or two, perhaps. And we're hoping that we'll be surviving. Yeah. yeah. And in the process of getting ready for this, one of the things that I think we both experienced is that there's days when it's really good to do nothing mm. and the body needs to do nothing. Yeah. You can want to listen to your body. If it's too tired, you're going to just, yeah. And there's days that you can get on your bike and just spin. You don't have to put any resistance on and you can just spin. And it's very, very good hmm. to just spin and go nowhere, to not feel like you're getting the best exercise, making the greatest progress towards your goal. That actually sometimes the greatest way to get to your goal is to not pursue it directly, to mm. not push it. And I think that's one of the things that central bankers have forgotten is that they've got this idea. Of course, they've changed their mandate from simply being price stability to price stability and controlling unemployment. Now it's price stability, controlling unemployment and making sure that the global economy is functioning and the U.S. stock market never implodes. So the mandates continue to expand. And what you said is absolutely critical. After the Depression, it was governments and central banks that assumed that they could fight pessimism mm -hmm. and that they could basically, through manipulating interest rates, keep growth on track. And by doing that, they could create public expectations of perpetual prosperity. And this is the nature of central banks creating targets. The targets aren't for them. The targets are for us. The targets are for us to know that someone is in control and on track. And that allows us to live with a sense of progress and perpetual growth and just leave it alone. The experts are in the house. They've got it under control. I can go about my business. What is my business? Oh, it's to spend, spend, spend. Well, and if you're in politics or you have a past in politics, that's a dream come true. But, you know, the, the people who have the experience in politics, I'm thinking of David Stockman, a guest of ours in the past. He says perpetual growth is an illusion. He just tears it to shreds. Fire in his belly, Stockman. I mean, it's it, every yeah. time I hear an interview with him, I just think, man, he must have strong coffee in the morning. There's something churning in his gut today. But that's the idea that he's after shredding, this idea that after seven years of prosperity, maybe what we have is a perpetual growth cycle. Because one of the things that he does is in a recent blog post, he calls into question the industrial production numbers 
which would suggest that the quality of our growth has been far more suspect than we would want to admit. The industrial production numbers have been revised downward here recently, and they were revised downward so heavily that the case for economic growth from 2012 to the present is all but gone. Let me just read a little bit from his site. As with many other economic accounts, we find of late that the Fed was serially overstating the level of economic activity, and therefore the whole recovery. As noted with last month's benchmark revisions, the whole industrial production series was revised downward, largely erasing the acceleration and recovery economists thought they saw in 2014 and even into 2015. That meant the contraction portion of the slowdown is now calculated to have begun earlier in 2015. But more importantly, the data series itself has been forced to belatedly recognize the whole slowdown from its start in 2012. So we have had virtually no growth since 2012. We've referenced the folks at the Economic Cycles Research Institute and how In 2012, they were calling for recession. Oops, no recession. 2013, they were calling for recession. Oops, no recession. And if after a while, you begin to say, are they the boy that cried wolf? Right. And apparently, they're not the boy that cried wolf. There was a wolf there the whole time. That's right. Just a wolf in sheep's clothing. Right. You've got the Fed massaging numbers, and you've got basically collusion amongst your top statisticians here in the United States to pretty up this picture of economic prosperity, growth, and recovery. And it doesn't exist. Where do you look for supporting evidence that, yes, the economy is, in fact, in recovery and growing? Where do you find evidence that, in fact, it's not? Well, certainly the industrial production numbers are part of that. We've talked about the industrial recession, which has been with us for at least 12 months, maybe 18, and Stockman would say could date back to 2012. And we've talked about the retail recession, which is already here. And you can look for other confirming evidence if you want to look south of the border. Exports from Mexico to the United States are on the decline, specifically automotive exports. I mean, and we are their largest trade partner. We are 80 percent of the Mexican economy ex oil. Okay, And so when they are struggling, it's a good indication that there's something wrong under our own hood. And so it seems to me that Stockman's on to something here. People have been living a lie, living with a delusion, but actually it's not something they created for themselves. It was something handed to them by officialdom, handed to them by the same folks who would say, I think it's a myth that expansions die of old age. Right. They never have to die. Why do they never have to die? They never have to die because we're in control of these things now. Central planners have it well in hand. Well, and you know, you say people have been deceived, but honestly, Dave, I think we need to get a little bit more specific than that because the person who doesn't have enough to make their bills or the person who doesn't have enough to maybe go out to the nice restaurant on the weekend, that person's not deceived. I'm going to give you an example. My wife and I had our 33rd wedding anniversary and we went out to, you know, one of the nicer restaurants in Durango and we were sitting there. I mean, it's great service, incredible food. There's absolutely no reason why on a Saturday night the restaurant shouldn't be brimming and and usually is. But, you know, it was only about a third full. And my wife looked at me and she said, you know what? Things are not booming. Things are not expanding. And, you know, we don't talk much about economics when I'm home. That's just not the topic of conversation, (laughs) me and my wife. But it was interesting. Her observation was there should be more people here. Something's wrong. So let's assume the Fed is looking at the same thing. And they're saying, look, we've got certain internal variables that suggest that the economy is not robustly in recovery. Mm -hmm. That's on the negative side. On the positive side, we still have the stock market hanging out a few percentage points below its all-time highs. That's on the positive side. So we have something positive to advertise. And we don't want to create some sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy with negativity breeding more negativity breeding more negativity. So we're going to have to speak positively. And that means we're going to at least speak to raising rates and we're going to do this stuff. One of the things that they're doing, Kevin, is, is they're assuming that everything is in the price. And everything technically is in the price, but it's not that everything is appreciated in the price. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. The stock market is priced well. Does that mean the economy is doing well? No, but that's the assumption. So everyone's assuming that because it's priced well at high levels, 
that all is well. Right. Well, you know, there's the efficient market hypothesis. This is what you're addressing, Dave, which assumes that all information is built into the price. But we know almost always the only way a person makes or loses money in any market is because all information is not built into the price and you're trying to look ahead. Right. In the last two to three months, we've seen a massive increase in volumes traded, whether it's cotton, iron ore, oil, and specifically contracts in commodities in China. And there was a migration of investor interest in speculating in stocks on leverage to that leverage, the margin accounts being curtailed and those speculative dollars migrated over to the commodities exchange. And the commodities exchange is seeing volumes. I mean, get this, a single day's volume, a single day's volume in iron ore. There was enough iron ore traded to build 178,000 Eiffel Towers. Hmm. On that same day. In one day. In one day on the Shanghai Exchange. On one day, cotton contracts traded enough. There was enough cotton traded, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell, on margin, with tremendous amount of debt, tremendous amount of leverage, to outfit every human being on the planet with a pair of jeans. In one day. Right, right. So you say, well, what is in the price of crude oil? What is in the price of oil? Copper, what is in the price of iron ore? There's actually a lot of things behind the scenes that are driving prices that are not real. In this case, it's a trillion dollars of speculative money that the People's Bank of China put into the system and it found its way very quickly into the commodity space after being told to go away from the stock market And it has nothing to do with the underlying commodity. It has nothing to do with it. So the same thing, you look at oil, we still have a glut. And you might think that as the price of oil has been rising off of its first quarter lows, that the glut of oil has been relieved. That would be incorrect. Hmm. Bloomberg reports that the OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the commercial inventories, which they track, have grown now to 67 days worth of inventories. That is five days more than what was seen in the depth of the global financial crisis after global oil demand had collapsed. Yet in this particular case, oil has been rising. Right. So if the price action doesn't fit the model, sometimes the model for understanding the market begins to shift. And in my opinion, this is dangerously so. So there's now a rationalization, and this is how it goes. Because Saudi Arabia has given up the role as the swing producer in the oil market, the market's response is to house more oil for security purposes. And so there are changing dynamics in the world oil market, or have prices been driven in the futures market instead? Mm -hmm. Have prices been, again, because of speculative flows, have prices been bumped without regard for the short-term supply and demand fundamentals? So I think the argument favors developing a cushion to absorb a spike in demand. And I guess I would take the other side of that argument, suggesting that the shock that needs to be prepared for is not a spike in demand, but rather preparing for demand leaving the oil speculator rather exposed to a drop in the price. And in the end, we see this, as with all investments, fundamentals, fundamentals of supply and demand actually do matter. Well, and I think we need to just jump to gold for just a moment, because we've talked about this for years, and especially in the last couple of months, how the actual supply of gold is now about one five hundredth of what's traded. Well, At some point, supply and demand do matter, and we likened it to musical chairs last week in the show, but that's exactly right. There's one chair, there's 542 ounces of gold being traded for every one contract that can be delivered. There's 542 people playing for the same chair, they just don't know it. Right, so you have a price anomaly with oil, and it doesn't match the supply and demand fundamentals. Right, there's too much oil right now. Right, right. You have a similar price anomaly with gold, only it's there's not enough gold. Right. Right. So it's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. But what you have with the news media is the demands of meeting real-time deadlines, publishing deadlines, and you have to come up with an explanation that meets the momentary press deadline. So mm-hmm. you rationalize away fundamentals if it doesn't fit your press deadline. And the variable lacking in this, again, the shifting of models to explain the price action, the variable lacking is patience. Mm -hmm. Forcing an explanation because of short-term pricing inconsistencies, I think you just wait around. Either the global economy comes roaring back, as the Fed suggests that it will and is doing, contrary to what David Stockman and the industrial production numbers would suggest, or we have Saudi and U.S. overproduction. 
and inventory levels really will have an impact. Demand may in fact drop and take prices lower, reflecting not only that deterioration, but the glut that remains a growing issue. So like you were talking about with the training, there are times when you lay off the training, when you sit back and you go, okay, as hard as this is, because we've got a big race in front of us, I'm going to rest today. And I think you do the same thing. You know, we were talking about central banking, but we should probably look at this even on our own and just say, all right, if the conditions outside look like things are overstressed, why wouldn't we just wait and watch things come into more order so that you can make a good decision? I mean, it seems to me like right now you want to stay cash liquid and stay out of the speculative markets that may be very overpriced right now. Well, I think that makes a lot of sense. If you can practice patience, if you can practice patience, most people can't. It's the missing variable in the long-term success of most investors to manage assets like an endowment manager manages. What an endowment manager looks at is multiple generations, not multiple quarters, multiple weeks, or multiple days. Right. He's expanding time out as much as possible, which requires a patient view, which requires a different perspective altogether. And I think it's very important, very important to bring that into the mix and not allow the news media and their requirement of publishing deadlines to determine your information flow and distort your understanding of what is actually happening. So think like an endowment manager, multiple generation. It's a much calmer way to live anyway. The opposite of that would be, say, a day trader, drinking coffee, continually taking Tums and living on Pepto-Bismol. Investing is not a sprint. For those who try it that way, I can give you a laundry list of people who've shot themselves in the head, treating investing like a sprint and not like an endurance race. The performance requirements and the insanity that goes with it is enough to be mind-numbing and maddening. And that's usually what happens to those, even the best, even the best who approach it from the short-term view only and don't embrace a longer-term perspective. So patience. You've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. You can find us at McIlvaney.com, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com, or give us a call at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. 